Okay, let's get started. Wow, full attendance today. Uh, so the only real announcement I have is that I posted uh, the last lab. And so that'll uh, do some stuff on operator overloading, which is what we've been talking about. But are there any questions about the final or last assignment, last lab? Anything? Bueller? Bueller? No questions? Okay. So, what have we been talking about so far? <clears throat> Making classes useful, but uh, what did we talk about last time? In per uh, yeah, our value references and uh, and the assignment operator, I think. Yeah, so uh, we know what operator overloading is. Is just making having an operator do something different than uh, what it's really intended to, or you're trying to change what it means for an operator to behave to make sense in the context in which it's used. So for Assign, for the assignment operator, I should be able to assign some type to an object of maybe a different type if it makes sense in that context. So like for string, uh, we should be able to assign a const care star, the thing between the double quotes, to a string because it makes sense there, even though they're different types. Uh, then we started talking about our value references. And so an R value reference, what is the difference between that and the other type of, of the other type of reference we saw? Right. So an R value is just uh, something that you can't directly take the address of. Um, and, and an L value is something you can take the address of. So the rule is, or not really true, but it's basically correct. If it has a name, so it's like a variable, it's an L value. Okay, so if it has a name, so like uh, X right here, or even the pal ref down here, because they have a name, they're L values. Be, uh, because I can take the address of an, a variable name. Whereas if we have a value, just uh, a simple value that is not a name, so like any number, just the number itself, or the computation right here that I haven't saved to a variable, those are R values because they're not a name. Uh, and I can't take the address of them for that reason. So, but we want to be able to pass things by reference, and so you think, okay, well, I can't take the address of this, but I want to pass it by reference anyway. So what do we do? We use an R value reference. So it's basically uh, a reference variable that refers to an R value. So the variable itself is still an L value because it's a name, but it's referring to something that is an R value reference. So you think, okay, why is this useful? So let's get back to what we were talking about at the end of last time. So I was motivating why, why do we even care about our value references? So think of this example that I mentioned before. So I should change this back. So let's just say we have a vector of strings. And if you recall, vector on the internals has a dynamically created, uh, it doesn't even really matter though. It has a, 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 an array of that type. So if we have a vector of strings, on the inside it has a, an, a normal array of strings. So let's just say that this thing, this internal array is completely full, and we want to call pushback on the vector. What has to happen if the internal array is full and we can't add anything to it? Yeah, yeah, I need to allocate new memory, right. So what happens is, well, we want to make sure that the contents before are in the same places they are after. So what usually happens is 
uh, if you have an array of some number of elements, and when you do a reallocation, you reallocate twice as much storage. So here we had uh, three strings, and here we will have space for six. So because we want to keep the original contents where they are in the new array, so this first uh, string has to go in the, into index zero, index one has to go to index one, index two has to go to index two, pretty simple. And then the thing that we're pushing back goes at the very next index. So here's the issue. Can strings be arbitrarily big? Yeah. So what if I did this? So, uh, so let's just see what happens. So what if I copied the strings over? So the, I'm, I have the strings in the uh, original places exactly the same. I'm not modifying them. But I'm copying the string over to the new place. Would that actually work? Would that be okay? Yeah, is there anything wrong with doing that? No, but what is something that we can do better? What, what is something that we don't really like about having to copy the strings over? It makes redundant copies. So, and, and also think of this. So we have this array on the back end, and I allocate this one, which is the larger array. What should we do with the original one? Well, when we're done doing the copies. Yeah, delete it, right? So remember that Vector has a dynamically created array on the back end. And so when we're done with the smaller array, when we're done making the copies to the new one, we should just delete the old one. So it seems kind of weird that, uh, so there's this famous quote by Bjarne Straustrup, who's the creator of C++, who said that um, only a computer scientist would think, if I have to move this data over to here, would you make a copy and then destroy the original, right? So it seems kind of stupid that we're having to have two copies all, if all we're doing is just moving the data over. That's all we really want. We don't need two independent copies. We just need the data to move. So that is the purpose of a move constructor and why our value references are important. So uh, copying, blah, 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 is resource intensive. It's not a good thing because you're doing a copy. Move assignment and move constructors are more efficient because they don't do a copy. That's all. That's all they are. So, uh, so there's a move assignment operator and a move constructor, and I'll show you both. Um, so what happens in a, um, in a move constructor is... Uh, you, you, you move the pointer over. So if you have a dynamically created memory, then what you do is you just move the pointer over, and that's all you need to do. And then you set the original pointer to null pointer. So you're just moving the pointer around. You're not copying the data around. You're just uh, changing where the pointers go. So... There's more to it, obviously, than that. But that's essentially the idea. So how do you actually do that? So let's actually make it ourselves. So let's just say we have a CP class. Actually, I'll just copy it from here. Where are you? Here. So I'll just copy the existing CP class implementation here. So let's see. So. So let's just see what this thing has. So it says uh, we have an integer pointer right here. And uh, what is this thing right here? So, so what, is, uh, what is this right here? Yeah, it's just a normal constructor. Okay. So what about this one right here? It's a destructor. Okay. So, so for these... For pretty much all of these, I'm not going to provide the implementation. I'm just going to show you what they look like. So uh, what is this thing, if you recall? Uh, operator overload, and in this case, is overloading what? Yeah, equals or assignment, yeah. 
So there's actually something wrong here. What should the uh, assignment operator take as its parameter? And in this case, it's the copy assignment operator. So we're copying from something to something via an assignment. So what should the argument type be? It should be CP class, but what else should we put with it? Yeah, const because we don't want to change the original and what and reference. Yeah, because I don't want to have to make a copy. Uh, oh, sorry, I don't want to make a redundant copy. Yeah, so so that I don't have to copy to get it into the uh, function right here. So const ref reference here. So let's actually do the the copy constructor here. So for the copy constructor. What argument does it take? What type? It's, all, it's, the, it's the same, right. So it's still a const CP class reference here. And then I, I'm not going to provide the details for it uh, because it's not really that important. So let's, instead of just me telling you what the move constructor and move assignment operator should take as, as its parameter, Let's figure it out for ourselves. So for a copy assignment, let's just do copy constructor, for example. I'm trying to construct this object over here from this one over here via a copy, OK? So I should pass it by reference, obviously, because I don't want to modify the original. I want an independent copy. So we want to make it const also, because we don't want to modify the original. What about for move? Well, we're still going to pass it by reference because we don't want to make a copy, a redundant copy. But am I going to modify the original if I'm moving from it? Yes. So should I pass it by const? No. So here, what I want is a non-const reference for the move assignment. So here, if I want to really specify it is a move assignment, I have to put double ampersands. So if you remember, the R value references are the things with the double ampersand. So here, what we're saying is that you could either pass it in via and make a copy of it, or you can move from it. E either choice is yours. So, and then what do you think about the uh, the move assignment operator. What is going to change about this in order to make it a move assignment operator? Yeah, take away const and what else? Uh, and double ampersand. So uh, the argument type here is exactly the same. It's whatever the type is, reference, reference. And for the move assignment, it's exactly the same story. So Let's actually think of this. So for unique pointer, can I make a copy of a unique pointer? No. So uh, does, do you think it has a copy assignment or copy constructor? No, because you can't copy it. Do you think it has a move constructor? Yes. And so. Uh, when I was talking about before, uh, wherever it is, maybe we'll get to it. Remember the move function? And I'll say I'll talk about it at some point, what it does. That's what it does. So I'll finally tell you what move does. So what move does is it converts whatever type you gave it unconditionally to an R value reference. Whatever you gave it, it converts it to an R value reference. Okay? So... Actually, maybe we'll go back. So let's go to the, the pointer slides, hopefully for the last time. Uh, so let's go down to unique pointer. So here, uh, we have uh, a unique pointer here. And I'm trying to move the assignment of, sorry, I'm trying to move the ownership of this unique pointer to this other unique pointer. So. Uh, what happens here is move converts the U putter on the right side to an R value reference, no matter what. So it converts it to an R value reference so that when we do the assignment here, 
it's going to call the move assignment operator for a unique pointer. So that's why you have to say move here, because it converts it to an R value reference. And if I had both of these uh, uh, assignments, so a copy assignment and move assignment, if I had both for a unique pointer, then I could say, I can just assign like this. So if you don't say move at all, it'll do the copy assignment implicitly. But if you call move on it, then it will call the, uh, the move assignment operator. So it just depends on what you're trying to work with. Are you trying to deal with something that you shouldn't copy or that you should be allowed to copy? So uh, that sort of thing. So yeah, so that's what the move function, move, uh, old slides, uh, yeah, so that's what the move function does. Any questions on any of this? Okay, um, so you may think, okay, well, uh, this seems kind of annoying, right? If I'm going to say uh, my copy constructor, copy, uh, uh, sorry, move assignment here, uh, sorry, move constructor, or any of the two assignment operators, um, it seems kind of annoying that we're going to do basically the same thing for both. So if I'm trying to copy from this thing, um, I'm still not going to modify it. So in fact, these two pieces of code are going to be almost identical. So uh, that seems kind of annoying. So what if we didn't have to actually provide the details of the implementation ourselves? So that's what default is for. So when did we see default before? A long time ago. Yeah, for switch. So. Uh, how, what did it do in switch? Right, so we had a bunch of cases, so like case one, case two, case three, blah, blah, blah. And then the default was the catch all case. So if it didn't fit into any of the cases before, it fell into the default case. We're, we're actually going to see another use of default here, which is kind of uh, interesting. So the issue here is that if we're like maintaining a student object, for example, then as ASU adds more services to, uh, for students, we may have to update the student class to be able to take advantage of those services. So if I have to keep making updates in every place that is relevant in the class, that could be error prone. So if I make an update in one place and not in another, that can cause an issue. So what if we wanted to minimize the number of places that I need to make an update? So default allows us to uh, do this. So what happens here is if we want the constructor to just make the object, we don't have to do anything special to it. Just put default onto it. And then it'll construct everything for you in the default way. So you don't have to do anything yourself, which is nice. So, uh, so how would you actually do that? Uh, so what you would do is, uh, let's just say we wanted to default the copy constructor, have it do the default thing, whatever that is. So then all you do is you just say equals default, like that. So you don't have to provide any implementation at all. It'll just do the default thing. It'll initialize every uh, uh, data member in here with the default value, whatever that is. If you have to do something special, then you have to provide the implementation yourself. But if you don't need to do anything, just put default. And then here, you can put default here too. So for any type of constructor, you can do the default thing. Uh, you can actually do the exact same thing with the assignments too. So if you just need to do the default thing and don't need to do anything special, just put default on, and it's much easier. Yeah. So if something is tri trivially copyable, then everything is initialized to default defaultly? <laughs> yeah, so you don't even need to say it yourself. So what was just mentioned is um, 
if your class is simple enough, whatever that means, then you don't even need to provide any constructors at all. So in those cases, the copy, move, everything is already made for you. You do not even need to say the constructor and default here. If your class is simple enough, so it's something called trivially copyable or trivially movable, don't even worry about what that is. Just know that um, if you want to reduce the amount of work you need to do and you don't need to do anything special, just say equals default on anything that you don't need to have specially done. That's all you need to say. Uh, yeah, so one of the issues here is if you need to provide an implementation on any of them, you have to provide it on all of them. Uh, and I'm not sure why the rule is like that, but that's what the rule is. Okay, so let's go on to a completely different topic, um, function objects. So we've been talking about um, operator overloading, right? And I think I mentioned this last time. So there's this weird operator that you can overload, which is called the function call operator. So here we're overloading the left and right parentheses. So it's not just a single character anymore, it's a double character. And so what happens here is um, if we overload this operator, then on whatever object we create, we can say the name of that with parentheses and maybe any arguments. So we can make it look like a function even though it isn't a function. So how would you actually do that here? So let's just see. So let's copy this into here. So this is actually a pretty simple uh, class. So here I'm going to make an instance of multiply. So remember, instance is the name of the object that you make. So M in this case. So uh, maybe we'll have like a different function. Uh, maybe not. So let's just leave it like this. So here, we're overloading the function call operator here because we're overloading the left right parentheses. How many arguments does this take? Two. So whenever I'm going to use these parentheses on this object M right here, I need to provide two arguments. So here I can just say C out M of 3, 5. And, uh, and what do you think that'll print? 15, yeah. So we're treating, so if you ignore this line right here, this multiply M thing, what do you think this M is? It looks like a function, but is it a function? No. So uh, you may think, okay, that's kind of stupid, right? I can just, uh, in here, just have a function multiply, if I can type, uh, int x, int y. And inside here, I can just say re return x times y. And then, I'm not sure why that's causing an issue, but... Okay, so then here I can just say m.multiply. So I can call the function, the actual name of the function, exactly the same way. So it's not real that we're doing anything really different here. We're just really reducing the amount of typing I have to do. So you may think, okay, what's the purpose of this? So uh, we're going to actually get to that in a second. So, uh, so this is basically what we just did. We make a product. Uh, a multiply object, and then we call it like a function, and then you use the value however you want. Or you can do both at the same time. It's not really important. Um, this isn't really that important either. Um, uh, sometimes you have something that's called anonymous, which means that it's not saved to a variable. Even though it actually is a variable, it's not saved to a variable. So. Uh, here we're making a variable called prod. Here we're just uh, creating it right in the same line and not using it any other time. We're just calling the constructor and then calling the function right here. Um, but don't worry about what anonymous is. So you may think, okay, so why are we talking about function objects? It's really something called a predicate that we're going to be really talking about. So it's, it's a function object. Um, uh, but a predicate is something that returns a bool value. 
So here in our multiply uh, version, we returned an int. So that can return any uh, type that we want, but a predicate always returns a bool. So a predicate could be um, I pass in two integers and, I, and it returns true if they're in sorted order and false otherwise. That could be a predicate. So it's true if they are in sorted order and false otherwise. That could be a predicate. So a unary predicate could be is taking one argument. So what's an example of a unary predicate? It takes one integer, let's say. What could be a predicate? So something that returns true or false on that one argument. Uh, equality with? Yeah, but I'm passing one value into the predicate, and I need to return true or false for something that depends on that value. So I'll give you an example. Um, I pass in the one value and it returns true if it equals zero and false otherwise. So another one could be um, it returns true if this one parameter is positive and negative otherwise, and false if it's negative. That could be a unary predicate. So what, what would be an example of a binary predicate taking two values? Yeah, so if I have a parameter x and a parameter y, it returns true if x is bigger than y. So uh, there are gazillions of predicates that we could define. Uh, another one could be uh, if x is negative and y is positive, so they have opposite sign, return true and false otherwise. So there are many types of predicates that we can make. So here's an example. Uh, I didn't even know that this was in here in advance, so it was good that I thought of that. So it's just a function object. That's all it is. So it's just a function object, but it returns a bool. So predicates aren't really special. It's just that they return a certain type, which will be useful later. So they just return bool. And in this case, I pass in parameter x. And it returns true if x is bigger than 0 and false otherwise. So a binary predicate could be like this one. If x is bigger than y, return true, uh, and false otherwise. Yeah? So is the, is the purpose behind this like inline validation? Then? It's inline something we'll get to. Mm -hmm. Other questions? OK. So uh, in the standard library, there are several uh, function objects like this. So you don't have to, like for greater than, you don't have to write that yourself. There's one already built into the standard library for you. So you may think, okay, what, again, why should we care about this? The reason is if we want to do something that is customized to what we want, then we need these things. So think of sort, for example. Could it be, so for the normal sort, it sorts them in ascending order. What if I wanted them in descending order? Is that something reasonable to ask? Yeah. So the default sort says, um, I can't actually do, um, sort these uh, in, in descending order because I'm defaulted to have them in ascending order. So what the sort function does is, it allows you to have a third parameter, which is a predicate. So the predicate says, I'm going to be looking at uh, a bunch of things, and I'm going to be comparing them for sort. So what sort does in the normal way is, if they are already sorted in ascending order, don't modify them. If they are in the opposite order, then swap them. So we saw this with bubble and selection sort, where if they were in the wrong order, we did a swap. The standard sort uh, algorithm in the library does the exact same thing. The algorithm's different, but it does swaps. So the predicate here would be, uh, I'm going to return true for these two parameters if they are in the right order that I want them to be. So if we wanted, so the naive implementation of sort is less equal. That's the default way that it sorts things. Is the thing on the front 
less than or equal to the thing right after it. If it's true, I won't make a swap. If it, they're in the wrong order, I will. But I could say if I wanted them in descending order for greater equal. So is this thing greater than or equal to the thing right after it? If they are, that means they are in descending order. If they are not, meaning they're in ascending order, then I want to make a swap. So it depends on what you actually want here. So that's, uh, these are things for sort. What if uh, you wanted something for remove if? How many of you have seen remove if? So uh, remove if, all it does is, let's just say you pass in a vector, and I want to remove everything from that vector that is negative, for example. So uh, I want to remove a whole bunch of things from this uh, vector that have a specific value or satisfy some predicate. So, uh, for, so that's the, um, for the third argument of remove if, you provide the predicate that you want to be true if you want that thing to be removed. So let's actually look at uh, these functions. So let's look at remove if. So you have to import the uh, algorithm header to get this to work. So you can actually look at the, the declaration of the function right here. So ignore the forward iterator thing for a second. So it takes the beginning of some, let's just say vector, and then the end of wherever you want to remove from, and then the third argument is a unary predicate. So what is a unary predicate again? It's a predicate, obviously, but what? Returns a bool, but what else in addition? It takes one argument. Why is it not a binary predicate here for remove if? So let's just say we're looking at a specific value right here, and we have to decide, do we want to remove this value or not? So would it make sense for the predicate to take two arguments then? No, because we're looking at one particular place in, uh, in the sequence, the vector that we're looking at. Well, think about sort. So let's go back to sort, uh, if it's here. Is it here? Yes, it is. So sort. So uh, let's look at this. So you can see that there are two different uh, uh, declarations of sort here. So the first one has um, the beginning and the end, and the second one has three, the beginning, end, and something called compare. So what should this be? Should it be a unary predicate or a binary predicate? Binary, why, for sort? Well, think about it. If two elements are in the wrong order, we have to figure out whether to make a swap. Would it make sense to look at a single value and figure out where it needs to go? No, because then we'd have to ask, does this value belong in this particular location? Well, that doesn't really make sense because we don't know any of the other values. But if I know two values, then I know whether those two values are in the wrong order or not. So we need a binary predicate here. And I'm not sure why it doesn't say binary predicate, but um, the, the third argument here could be a binary predicate. Okay, any questions about that? So it's a function object. So it's just something that uh, behaves like a function and takes two arguments and returns a bool, depending on what those arguments are. So it could be an actual object or an actual function. So it's just something that, that has the function call syntax. So we can call it like a function, whether it's a function object or just a plain old function. And so that actually leads us into, well, how do I actually specify one of these function objects? Do I have to make a class for this or, and, and then make an instance of it and pass it in? Or is there a much simpler way? And there's a much simpler way. It's something called a lambda. So what is a lambda? A lambda is the second godsend to vector. So 
What is a lambda? A lambda, all it is, is just a shorthand for what we just did. Making a class, having it overload the, the parentheses to make it look like a function, instantiate one of those objects, and then pass it in. A lambda does all of that in one uh, statement. So how do you actually do it here? So um, I'm not actually sure exactly what each of these pieces does, but this is what you have to do. You have to say square brackets, um, and that has something uh, completely different. It has uh, nothing to do with this yet. In the parentheses, you say whatever arguments you need to pass. So for the multiply version, uh, remember multiply takes two arguments, so this one takes two, and then you do whatever you need to do as you would before. So in this case, we return x times y. If we want to make a unary predicate like this one, then we would need to pass in a single value and then return the bool that we uh, need. So uh, here we're assigning to auto for reasons that are kind of technical. Um, we're making, uh, we're technically making an instantiation of this lambda. And this lambda says, okay, I have a square brackets on the front and it can take any argument of any type. So auto here can mean any type, and then returns if x is bigger than zero. Why might this be a good idea to put auto as the, the, the parameter type? What if I wanted to feed an int, or a double, or anything that looks like an integer, or, or a value? If I just wrote int like this, would that restrict the number of the things that I can pass to it? Yeah, so that's why we say auto here. To say, you can pass in anything you want to this function. The issue is that you have to have a recent version of C++ in order for that to work, yeah. Okay, now you just answered. I was gonna ask, would there be a specific version if you use lambda? Yeah, so for, for normal lambdas without this auto thing, I think all you need is C++ 11. For the auto thing, in some cases, I think you need 14, and then in some other cases, you need 17. I'm not sure of the details there. So, um, so let's actually think about what a lambda is. So remember the, the uh, predicates that we were doing before. We're, we're making a class, and then we're just uh, overloading the function call operator and then doing stuff with it. So what if we had some... Uh, auto um, some integer n equals 100. Or maybe this could be from the user input, for example. And instead, here we say if x is greater than n, then we're okay. So maybe uh, we're filtering based off of the user input, for example. So think about what this means. The class here so the function call operator here takes how many arguments? It takes one argument. So this n right here lives outside of the lambda, correct? The n lives outside of the lambda. So remember what a lambda is. A lambda is just a shorthand for making a class like this. So the function call operator, remember, for this lambda that we're talking about right here, takes exactly one argument, whatever that is. Where does this n live with respect to that class? It lives outside the class. So how can the function call operator access that, that variable if it's outside the class? It actually can't. So that's where these square brackets come into play. So I'm not exactly sure what happens here, but um, and in fact, this, the syntax is kind of funky. So I'm not going to actually test you on uh, what this exactly means, but the square brackets mean a capture. So if I'm trying to capture a variable from outside and then use it on the inside of the lambda, the square brackets are where all the magic happens. So the square brackets just uh, deal with anything outside the, outside the lambda so that you can use it inside the lambda. The parentheses are for any actual arguments to the lambda, and the curly braces are just the actual code of the lambda. So 
uh, why would you actually need to make a lambda like this? So let's just say that we had uh, a vector like this. So let's just uh, import ve include vector and let's make a vector of ints uh, v's equals uh, 42, 99, 73, for example. So what if I wanted to sort this vector? Well, I need to include the, actually, I'm not sure about this, but I think you need to include the algorithm header for that. And then what I need to do is uh, call sort uh, v's.begin uh, v's.end. So remember for sort, it takes the, the beginning of whatever you're looking at and wherever you want the end to be, and it does the sort. So if I did the sort like this, then what is it sorting them in? In what order in this case? In ascending order, good. So what if I wanted them in descending order? So let's go back to the uh, slides here. So, um, so let's look at the function objects that are already built. So less uh, underscore equal is what is used um, for sort if you don't provide anything else. But what if we wanted greater equal? So all we need to do is just say greater equal and then other stuff uh, that you don't need to worry about. So all this, all we're doing here is the, fun the function object, you can think of it as a lambda, is already built for you and you just pass it in as the third argument. You don't need to do anything special here. What if we wanted to uh, call remove if uh, from before? So we would need to go from v's.begin, v's.end, and then remove if we're required to provide a third argument to say, should we remove this one value or should we not? So all we need to do is just make a simple lambda like this and then have it be like this. I'll make it cleaner to read. So like this. Uh, let's actually make it a little cleaner. So all we're doing here is we're making a lambda for the third argument of remove if. Let's convert it to 50, for example. So we're, all we're doing is we're making a lambda right here and it returns true if the value of whatever was passed in is at least 50, is bigger than 50. So let's actually see that this, this actually works. So let's print uh, every element in the vector. So uh, there's actually something that I think uh, won't actually work here. So let's actually see what happens. So CD desktop. So let's compile our file. Oh, I need to do uh, C++ 11 because of the initialization. Oh, <laughs> yeah, because I don't have a recent version of C++. C++. Let's do 17. Ah, perfect. So did it actually remove any values here? No. So what do you think happened? Well, what is a good way to figure out exactly what happened? I figured this would actually happen, but there's a, there's a reason for it. Uh, anyone know why? So let's actually go to remove if. So let's just see what actually returns. So it says remove elements from range transforms the range first to last. So, um, so you can think of this as the beginning of our vector and the end into a range where all of the elements for which the, the predicate right here returns true, the things we want to remove are removed and returns an iterator to the end of that range. So all this really does is it shuffles elements around. So let's look at this example. Ignore the fact that it's actually just an integer array. Think of it as a vector. So we have, a say, a vector right here. And then we're calling remove if on is odd. 
So anything that's odd, I want to remove. I want them gone. Um, so what happens is 2, 4, 6, and 8. What happens is those elements are moved to the front and all of the other ones are moved to the back. Nothing is actually removed. Why do you think that is? Well, but here's the thing. I want them removed. I want them gone from the vector. But it doesn't actually remove them from the vector. Why is that? Well, there's a certain amount of space, but there are functions for vector that remove elements. So why doesn't it actually remove them? I don't actually know the answer, but what I think the answer is, is that this is much faster. It's more efficient because um, if, you just remove, if you just move the elements to a certain place, swaps are cheap. Removing elements is not. So that's probably the reason for doing this. And if you're removing elements, then you could, in principle, move to a smaller size uh, vector. And so then you'd have to do reallocations and then possibly copying or moving things over. It could be a giant mess. So that's why I think it's this way. So what I think they are doing is trading efficiency for hundreds of hours of programmer time trying to debug why in the world this is doing this. That's the choice that they make. OK? Uh, so if you are so, so fortunate to make a remove if function like this, would you actually remove the elements or would you actually keep them? What do you think remove if should do? Remove, okay? So if you're fortunate to make a, a function like this, um, have it think about what it actually should do versus uh, trying to get an efficient version of it. Because uh, what are you trying to save? Hundreds of hours of programmer time or microseconds of computation time? Programmer time is more, much more important and costly. So um, yeah, so remove if actually gives you the, the position to where all the elements before it are uh, the ones that are OK, and then the ones that appear after are the ones that you wanted to remove. So that's what actually happens there. But any questions about what a lambda is? Yeah. Could you do that in conjunction with the read side to like essentially make it do what it was supposed to do? Yeah, but then I have to do copies oh. or, or moves if the case, whatever the case may be. Yeah. So uh, what it appears to be here is that the things on the front that don't satisfy the predicate for removing, they maintain the same order that they originally had. And, and the things on the end, as what it appears to be here, are not guaranteed to be in any order. So if you wanted to uh, uh, move elements around, from a sorted vector first, you have to sort the vector first, then do the remove if, if you want them in a certain order. Uh, is that, does that answer your question, or? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happens here is that um, when we say uh, dot begin and dot end. This dot end always is the position after the last index, the, the last valid index. So what happens here is when you call remove if, that returns to you the index right after the last OK values at the front. So it's really the first index into something that satisfied the predicate before. So uh, I don't know what the value is necessarily, but it's one of the values that satisfied the predicate before for, for removing. And then uh, here's code to actually do that. But we haven't really talked about iterators yet, so I can't really talk about that. Any other questions? 
All right, I'll see you on Friday.